हेलो माय डियर स्टूडेंट्स वेलकम बैक टू माय चैनल होप यू ऑल आर डूइंग गुड टुडे आई एम गोइंग टू स्टार्ट वन शॉर्ट रिवीजन ऑफ चैप्टर सेवन दैट इज सिस्टम ऑफ पार्टिकल्स एंड रोटेशनल मोशन इट इज द मोस्ट डिफिकल्ट चैप्टर ऑफ क्लास इलेवेंथ फिजिक्स अकॉर्डिंग टू स्टूडेंट्स बट इट इज नॉट सो इफ यू ट्राई टू अंडरस्टैंड ईच एंड एवरी टॉपिक ऑफ दिस चैप्टर दैन इट बिकम्स वेरी इजी नाउ अप टू चैप्टर सिक्स इन विच इन द प्रीवियस चैप्टर्स वी डिस्कस्ड अबाउट पार्टिकल मोशन पार्टिकल विलॉसिटी पार्टिकल एसोलेशन इन वन डायमेंशन टू डायमेंशन और थ्री डायमेंशन वॉट इज पार्टिकल पार्टिकल इज अ बॉडी विच हैज फाइनाइट मास बट इट्स साइज एंड इंटरनल स्ट्रक्चर कैन बी इग्नोर फॉर एग्जाम्पल आई हैव दिस मार्कर सो आई एज्यूम दिस मार्कर इज अ पार्टिकल हुज मास इज फाइनाइट बट इट्स साइज एंड इंटरनल स्ट्रक्चर कैन बी इग्नोर इफ यू अप्लाई सम फोर्स ओवर दिस पार्ट मार्कर वॉट हैपेज this particle this marker moves from one position to another position it has some velocity it has some acceleration right now but in this chapter we discuss about system of particles it means i assume this marker right so in the previous chapter we assumed that this marker as a particle but in reality it is not so this marker consists of a large number of particles and that is called system of particles so suppose this is a any body suppose ball or anything right so this consists of a large number of particles and this system of particles is called extended body and in this chapter we discuss about extended body as a rigid body we discuss about rigid body what is rigid body what happens when you apply some force on this rigid body then in that one you have to studied about center of mass then motion of center of mass momentum conservation after that we discuss about torque and angular momentum then equilibrium of a rigid body then equations of rotational motion what is relation between linear and rotational motion then moment of inertia and values of moment of inertia for different geometrical objects so we'll cover all these topics in this chapter and discuss each topic one by one starting with rigid body you know extended body here we assume as a rigid body so what is rigid body and what is the motion of that is different types of motions of rigid body then we'll discuss about center of mass which is most important topic of this chapter okay so let us start this chapter with rigid body okay now in this chapter we mainly discuss about rigid body and their motion right but what is this rigid body you know chapter name is what system of particles system of particles means extended body system of particles means extended body what is this extended body it means all those bodies which have large number of particles suppose this is a marker and this marker has large number of particles inside it so this is an extended body and it has finite size and particles mutually interact with one another this extended body has large number of particles right and all those particles are mutually interacted with each other this is called extended body when you apply some force on this extended body what happens deformation takes place for example balloon but in some cases suppose this uh, marker or any mobile or duster anything if you apply some force on it no deformation takes place it means in some extended body deformation takes place and in some extended body no deformation takes place so what is this rigid body rigid body are those extended body which in which no deformation takes place which has definite shape and size but it is an idealized idealized means just assumption that it has no de because anything if you apply force on that one na some amount of deformation takes place so this rigid body is an idealized extended body which has definite shape and size right and in physics term what is rigid body the distance between all pairs of particles do not change on application of any force suppose this is a rigid body right and it has large number of particles after applying some force on this rigid body again shape and size of this particle remains same 
and the distance between all pairs of particles suppose distance between this these two particles are this one this two is this one so here also the distance between these two particles remains same distance between these two particles do not change in that case you can say that that body is rigid body so distance between all pairs of particles do not change on application of any force on it that is called rigid body now when you apply force on this rigid body motion takes place so there are different kinds of motions of rigid body first one is translational motion second one is rotational motion and third one is planar motion so we will discuss this type of motion in detail first to take a screenshot of this one fast now kinds of motion of a rigid body because what is chapter name system of particles and rotational motion system of particles means extended body and we have to study about an idealized extended body that is rigid body and their rotational motion right but there are other types of motion also in rigid body first one is translational motion second one is rotational motion and third one is planar motion what is this translational motion suppose this is a body right extended body rigid body and here i assume only two particles a and b and after some time this body under the application of force it reaches to this point right so if the line joining these two particles is always parallel throughout the motion after some time suppose this particle reaches to this point again the line joining these two particles remains parallel throughout the motion this type of motion is called translational motion right and all these particles move with same velocity two important points are there all particles are parallel to each other throughout the motion and they move with same velocity and these particles are internal particles right again a translational motion is of two types one is linear translational motion or you can say rectilinear translational motion and curvilinear transla translational motion what is this linear linear means rectilinear translational motion if the path joining the particles at any point is a straight line paths are always straight line then the path taken by every particle in this translational motion is a straight line then that type of motion is called linear translational motion if paths are straight line and if path taken by these particles are not a straight lines it suppose it takes path like this like this one curve okay like this one so if the path taken by the particles are curved lines then this type of motion are called curvilinear translational motion it depends upon the path after some time the distance between the two particles always remains parallel translational motion is there the line joining the two particles but the path taken by the particle is straight line then that was a linear translational motion if the path taken by the particle is curved line then that is curvilinear translational motion hope it's clear to all of you next one is rotational motion what is difference between translational and rotational here every particle moves in circular path of different radii about a fixed axis right suppose there is a pivot point example table fan or fan wheels of the bus this is a fixed point pivot point right pivot point or fixed can you say fixed points and all particles a b c moves in a circular path like this one all particles moves in a circular path about this fixed axis so this type of motion is called rotational motion every particle moves in circular path of different radii radius distance from this center pivot point is different for different particles right they move in a different circle but all particles moves in a circular path right and this type of motion are called rotational motion and here the line joining any two particle is not parallel to each other right the distance between a and b is like this one here point reaches to this point so these are not parallel to each other here line joining any two particles are not parallel also one more thing in this case translational motion velocity is same velocity of all particles is same here velocity of diff particles is different it is not same or constant right 
example fell. So we have to study about rotational motion in discuss, uh, detail in this chapter. Again third one is planar motion. It is nothing but it is nothing but just a combination of translational rotational motion. Translational motion plus rotational motion forms this planar motion. So we have to discuss in detail only about this rotational motion in this chapter. And to discuss the rotational motion of any rigid body because a rigid body has large number of particles, system of particles are there. So when you apply force, how you observe the motion of that rigid body because it has large number of particles. So to study the rotational motion of rigid body, you have to first study about center of mass. What is center of mass? Then motion of center of mass. Then after that, torque, angular momentum. We'll discuss all these topics. So please take a screenshot of this one. After that, we'll move to the next topic. Now, from here, the main topic of the chapter starts. That is center of mass. What is center of mass and why we study about center of mass in case of rigid body, right? Okay, you know Newton's law. Newton's law is valid only for point objects, right? Suppose this is a marker. According to Newton's law, if you apply some force on this marker, what happens? It comes in motion, it has some velocity, acceleration, everything you know. But here in this chapter, you studied about system of particles. That is a system where large number of particles are present. That is extended body. Here you studied about extended body. And in extended body, you studied about rigid body, right? So in extended body, there are large number of particles. Suppose this is an extended body. Here large number of particles are present. Now how you study the motion of this extended body? If you apply some force on this extended body, what happens? Each particle comes in motion. Can you observe the motion of each particle? It's very difficult to observe it right now. So to observe the motion of this extended body, here also Newton's law is valid. But for that one, you must know about one thing that is center of mass. What is center of mass? Because here large number of particles are present and it's very difficult to study the motion of each particle. For that one, we assume one point in this body that is center of mass where whole mass of the body is supposed to be concentrated. Here large number of particles are there. Suppose this is a point. Suppose not it is always at the center of any body. It is at any, it can be at any places, right? Suppose here, this one is center of mass. What is this? It is the point where whole mass of the body is supposed to be concentrated. Whole mass of the body is supposed to be, sorry, two times I have written, supposed to be concentrated, right? If you know the center of mass of any extended body, here we study about rigid body. To study the motion of that rigid body, you must know about center of mass, right? If you know center of mass, you can easily study about the motion of that rigid body. You can easily determine the velocity of that rigid body, acceleration, force, everything, right? Now, suppose F equal to, is F is what? M into A. For point object, this is the acceleration of that object. Linear momentum is what? P equal to MV. V is the velocity of that object. But in case of this extended body, large number of particles are there. So if you know the center of mass, then you apply some force, then this acceleration is what for extended body? Acceleration of center of mass. This velocity is what? As velocity of center of mass. So you must have the knowledge of center of mass of any rigid body so that you can easily describe its motion. Now, in extended body, large number of particles are there. First, I am going to find center of mass of two particle system. Suppose there is one system in which only two particles are present, M1 and M2. And I am discussing it in one dimension first and two dimension, three dimension, right? Suppose this particle moves in one dimension, right? So in this two system, two particle system, you have to find the center of mass. How you find the position of center of mass? There is one formula for that one. Suppose this first particle is at distance x1 from the origin. x1 is distance of mass 1 from origin O. And x2 is what? x2 is distance of mass, second mass from origin, right? This m2. Now, 
Suppose that let C be the point where center of mass of these two particle system is there. So what is the position of this center of mass? Let it be at distance x from the origin, right? And its position is given by this x is position of center of mass. It is given by m1 x1 plus m2 x2 by m1 plus m2. You must remember this formula, right? x equal to m1 x1 plus m2 x2 by m1 plus m2. This is the position of center of mass for a two particle system. If both body have same mass, m1 equal to m2, you know, suppose there are two particles in this system and both have same mass. So center of mass is always at the center of the line joining the two bodies. Suppose here, if you put m, m1 equal to m2, then x becomes what? If this is m1 equal to m2, it means twice m, right now, m1 is m then x1 plus m x2 by twice m because m1 equal to m2 let it be m in that case m common mm -M cancel it becomes x by 2 it means if two objects have same mass if this if any body if mass is uniformly distributed it means all have same mass then center of mass is exactly at the midpoint of in two, in two body system at the center of the two bodies it means at a distance x by 2 but if mass is not uniformly distributed right now uh, suppose one body have mass m1 and the body has mass twice m1 right then in that case you have to use this formula this is the position of center of mass for a two body system right for n particle system you know in case of extended body large number of particles are there if there are n number of particles present in that body m1 m2 m3 then in that case you have to find position of center of mass as m1 x1 plus m2 x2 plus dash 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 mn xn divided by m1 plus m2 this one is only for two body system n particle system is m3 m4 m5 mn so you know addition of all this you take summation sign and m1 m2 m3 means i equal to 1 to n mi xi by summation of mi and this summation of mi you can write capital m this is total mass of the body suppose the total mass of the body is m and there are large number of particles m1 m2 m3 in this way so this is the position of center of mass for n particle system summation mi xi by m right this one is only for x dimension if the particle moves in two dimensions suppose this one is x axis this one is y axis and particle is at this point what is the position of this particle first particle m1 x1 and y1 and it moves to position this one and the position x2 y2 this is the position of second part sorry this one is the position of second particle m2 its position is x2 y2 in coordinates so in two dimension you have both x and y coordinates so x coordinate is same and y coordinate how you find center of mass in two dimension x is same summation m i x i by m here y is what in y direction also m i y i by m this is the position of x coordinate and y coordinate and total position of this center of mass suppose center of mass is at this point c so it is given by capital x and capital y and you know what is capital x right position of center of mass along x axis for n particles and this is position of center of mass along y axis for n number of particles in this way you define x and y in the same way in three dimension also right in three dimension you can write z axis movement is along z axis also so summation m i z i by capital m i equal to 1 to n this is in k because the particle moves in three dimension it has both x its movement is along both x axis y axis and z axis so center of mass in three dimension is represented by x y and z coordinate this is the position of center of mass in three dimension so in this way you define center of mass what is the position of center of mass and if you know center of mass of any body you can easily describe its motion so first to take a screenshot of this one then we will discuss next topic now you know center of mass in three dimension 
this is position of center of mass along x coordinate is summation mi xi i equal to 1 to n by m position of center of mass along y coordinates is what summation i equal to 1 to n mi y i by m and along z coordinates summation mi z i by m this is position of center of mass along three dimensions x y and z now you know position along three direction right now what is the position vector now you have to write this position vector of center of mass as r equal to x i plus y j plus z k this r is what position vector of center of mass position vector of center of mass in case of three dimension is position of suppose here first body has mass m1 its position is r1 second body has mass m2 its position is r2 in this a large number of particles are there third body has mass r3 so this first body has position center of mass along all three direction x y and z in the same with second also third also so in total calculation you have to write position vector of center of mass in three dimension as x i plus y j plus z k x you know y you know and z you know right and in this way you can write r equal to summation m i r i i equal to 1 to n by m m is total mass of the body and r i is what r i is x i i plus y i j plus z 1 k suppose for first particle position vector is r 1 x 1 i plus y 1 j plus z 1 k for second particle r 2 x 2 i plus y 2 j plus z 3 k right now for first particle position vector is r 1 it has coordinate along x 1 y 1 and z 1 so r 1 is x 1 i plus y 1 j plus z 1 k and similarly position vector for second particle is r 2 here x 2 y2 and z3 so you can add r2 as x2y plus y2j plus z3k so in terms of position vector you can write it as r equal to m i r i summation i equal to 110 by m right so these are our center of mass now if center of mass of rigid continuous body if the mass of the particle is continuously distributed inside the body in that case you are not able to differentiate first particle from second particle third particle in that case you just write mass of first particle as delta m1 second particle as delta m2 third particle as delta m3 in this way you write so you just in place of this summation mi you write in case of continuous distribution delta mi right Similarly, in this way also x, y and z in all three you replace just m i by delta m i. First particle has mass delta m1, second has delta m2, third has delta m3 in case of continuous body. You treat this rigid body as a continuous distribution of mass. Now this summation delta m i is replaced by integration. You know now if large number of particles are there and they are continuously distributed in that case you replace the summation by integration. You already know these things right. So summation delta m i is replaced by integration d m and this is total mass of the body m. Similarly summation delta m i x i is replaced by integration x d m delta m i y i summation replaced by y d m summation delta m i z i is replaced by integration of z d m. So, in this way you replace this summation by integration. So, you test the center of mass coordinates are x becomes 1 by m integration of x d m y becomes 1 by m integration of y d m and z position of center of mass along z axis is 1 by m integration z d m. Right? These are center of mass coordinates if the mass are continuously distributed for continuous body right and in vector form you can write r equal to 1 by m integration of r dm so hope it's clear to all of these are all about center of mass right after this when you apply force on any body that body moves but if you apply force on any rigid body so you have to study about motion of rigid body and in that case 
motion means what is the velocity of rigid body acceleration of rigid body and for that one you observe the velocity of center of mass because in case of rigid body large number of particles are there so you are not able to study about each particle what is the velocity of first particle second for third particle in that case you have to find velocity of center of mass acceleration of center of mass so please take a screenshot of this one first then we will discuss motion of rigid body right now motion of center of mass when you apply force on any rigid body that body starts moving but where that force acts on the rigid body you know newton's law is valid for point masses only so when you apply force on any rigid body suppose there is any rigid body when you apply force on this rigid body that force acts at center of mass why at center of mass because at center of mass whole mass of the body is concentrated so there is motion of center of mass and in motion of center of mass we will discuss velocity of center of mass and then acceleration of center of mass so first what is velocity of center of mass you know position vector of center of mass we already discussed right now what is this r equal to m i r i summation this one i equal to 1 to n divided by total mass of the body this is position vector of center of mass this one now to calculate its velocity you just multiply this m to this side m r equal to m1 r1 plus m2 r2 this m i r i you put i equal to 1 2 3 4 then m1 r1 plus m2 r2 plus m3 that's it just differentiate this with respect to t differentiating differentiating both sides with respect to time with respect to time it means m mass is constant so m dr by dt equal to m m1 is also constant mass of the body is always constant so dr1 by dt this displays uh, position vector changes with time dr2 by dt plus dash dash m and drn by dt i know dr by dt is what rate of change of position vector is nothing but velocity of that center of mass capital v so this is mv equal to m1 this dr1 by dt is velocity of first body this dr2 by dt is velocity of total velocity of second body so m1 v1 plus m2 v2 plus dash 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 right so this mv equal to this one and this v equal to summation of i equal to 1 to an mi vi by capital m this is the expression for velocity of center of mass right you can write vcm also or capital v also this is the velocity of center of mass summation mi vi by m right now after this acceleration of center of mass you know mv is what m1 v1 m2 v2 this is this now now again differentiating both sides with respect to time again you differentiate this one so mass is again constant quantity so dv by dt equal to m1 dv1 by dt plus m2 dv2 by dt plus dash 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 this dv by dt is what rate of change of center of velocity rate of change of velocity of center of mass is acceleration of center of mass a a is what capital a is acceleration of center of mass so ma equal to m1 a1 a1 is acceleration of first body a2 is acceleration of second body dv2 by dt plus dash 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 so ma equal to m1 a1 plus m2 a2 plus dash 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 and from here a our acceleration of center of mass acm is summation m i a i i equal to 1 to n by m this is the expression for acceleration of center of mass right hope it's clear to all of you what is velocity of center of mass what is acceleration of center of mass right now from here m a equal to what m1 a1 plus m2 a2 plus dash dash m1 a1 is what total force acting on first particle f1 m2 a2 is what total force f2 acting on second particle plus f3 dash 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 now this f1 f2 f3 is total force acting on all the five particles and that force must be equal to the external force actually uh, total force acting on any particle suppose first particle force external force also act and internal force also act due to other particles but internal force cancel each other due to action reaction pair according to newton's third law to every action there is equal and opposite reaction if first force exerts on 
if first body exert force on second body then this second body also exerts force on first body they are mutually interacted with each other they are cancel each other so net internal force is always zero only total force acting on any body is due to external force only so this f1 plus f2 plus f3 is f external this f external is this one and this is net force of all external forces that act on the system this is question number 4 from equation 4 it is clear that this is acceleration of center of mass right now so from this equation it is clear that total external force at which point because this is acceleration of center of mass it means center of mass it means what center of mass of a system of particle moves as if all the mass was concentrated at the center of mass right in this from equation 4 It is also clear that if F external is 0, F external 0 means acceleration of center of mass is 0 and if acceleration of center of mass is 0 it means this is what dv by dt is 0 it means velocity of center of mass is constant and this is nothing but Newton's first law. What is Newton's first law? If no external force acts on body, then that body moves with constant velocity. Here velocity of center of mass is constant if F external is 0. This is Newton's first law. So hope it's clear to all of you. Motion of center of mass. What is the expression for velocity of center of mass? What is the acceleration of center of mass? From this equation, total force acts at which point? At center of mass. So hope it's clear to all of you. Please take a screenshot of this one. Then we move to the next topic. Now linear momentum for a system of particles. Linear momentum for a system of particles is equal to sum of linear momentum to two individual particles. It means P equal to P1. P1 is linear momentum of first particle. P2 is linear momentum of second particle. In this way for n particles you write down P1 plus P2 plus P3 plus dash dash. This P is linear momentum of a system of n particles you can say this is linear momentum of center of mass right and you know what is the formula for momentum of individual particle p equal to mv so for first particle linear momentum is m1 v1 for second particle linear momentum is m2 v2 for nth particle linear momentum is n n v m you can write this has summation i equal to 1 to n m i v i this is equation number 1 this is linear momentum for a system of n particles now what is velocity of center of mass we already calculated this one v velocity of center of mass is summation m i v i by m and from here you can easily calculate summation of m i v i is what m v v is center of mass capital v i have taken here for center of mass right so m into total m is total mass of the body and v is velocity of center of mass this is equation number two now you put this equation 2 in values of from this equation 2 in equation 1 summation m i v i is what m v so you can write p equal to m v this v is what velocity of center of mass and this capital p is what momentum of center of mass it means total momentum of a system of n particles is equal to product of total mass of the body and velocity of center of mass of the body this is total momentum for a system of particles right now newton's law for a system of particles right you know p is what p is m into v total mass of the body into velocity of center of mass of the body so you differentiate with respect to t newton's second law is what rate of change of momentum to calculate so dp by dt is d by dt m v m is constant you take out say dv by dt and this dv by dt is what acceleration capital A acceleration of center of mass and you know we already find this equation m into a acceleration of center of mass is what this is total acceleration of the center of mass it is m into a is f external so dp by dt equal to f external this is newton's second law of motion for a system of particles if total external force is directly proportional to rate of change of linear momentum of a system of particles this is Newton's second law now after this in this one center of mass law of conservation of linear momentum for a system of particles 
you know dp by dt is f x we already find this equation right now this is equation number suppose 4 now here if x is x f external is 0 it means no external force acts on the system it means dp by dt is 0 and dp by dt is 0 means p is constant p is what p is linear total linear momentum of center of mass is constant so this is law of conservation of linear momentum for a system of particles Tot if total external force if total external force acting on a system is zero then total linear momentum of system also remains constant so these are all about center of mass now center of mass is over next we'll discuss about rotational motion you know to produce linear motion in any body what is required yes force is required in the same way to produce rotation in any body what is required torque is required so we next we'll discuss about torque and different terms related to rotational motion like angular velocity angular acceleration angular momentum all these things okay so please take a screenshot of this one now torque or moment of force what is this torque it is rotational analogy of force you know to produce any linear or translative motion in a body you have to apply some force if you apply some force this body moves from one position to another position but if you want to rotate this body then what you have to do suppose you fix this point right this point is fixed now you apply force at some other point then what happens this body starts rotating about this fixed point or fixed axis right greater the force apply greater is the rotation greater is the turning effect it means this is the turning effect when you apply some force and this turning effect of force about axis of rotation is called torque torque is nothing but turning effect of force when you apply some force at any point then how much it rotates the body it turns the body that turning effect of force about axis of rotation is called torque and the best example is door suppose this is the fixed point right it means this one is axis of rotation about which the door rotates and you apply suppose handle is at this point you apply some force near the handle then what happens the door turns greater the force apply greater the magnitude of force greater is the turning effect about this axis of rotation and also you always apply force near the end then near the fixed point why if you apply force near this point fixed point near this this then less turning effect is produced it means greater the distance from this axis of rotation at which force is applied greater this distance greater is the turning effects so this turning effect of force about the axis of rotation is called torque and on which factor it depends it depends on magnitude of force greater the magnitude of force applied greater is the turning effect and also it depends on this distance this is distance is what this one is axis of rotation about which the body rotates and this one is line of action of force along which the force is applied and this is the perpendicular distance from this axis of rotation to the line of action of force greater this distance greater is the turning effect so it also depends on perpendicular distance of line of force from the axis of rotation and mathematically it is given by this perpendicular distance into this force force into on on is this distance r from this fixed axis of rotation and this torque is represented by the symbol tau it is called tau like this one right and mathematically it is written as tau equal to f into o n force you know distance you know you can easily find the torque also one more thing this torque is a vector quantity it means angle also matters this is the direction in which you are applying force to open the door and this is the fixed distance from the axis of rotation perpendicular distance if you apply force at 90 degree remember this point you always open the door to apply force near the end near the handle 90 degree to this perpendicular distance right if this distance is 90 degree then maximum turning effect is there if you apply force along this one along this distance r if you open you want to open the door 
and you apply the force along the perpendicular distance there is no turning effect and in that case angle between f and r is zero so maximum turning effect is when angle between f and r is 90 degree so this angle also matters right now if angle is zero then minimum torque angle is 90 degree maximum torque that's why this torque is given by it is a vector product it is given by tau equal to this r cross f r is the perpendicular distance from the axis of rotation to the line of action of force and f is the force applied and what is direction it is a vector quantity so it has some direction Direc direction is given from this expression tau equal to r cross f you know a vector c equal to a cross b you already studied about vector product na? cross product a cross b so this c is a vector perpendicular to the plane containing a and b this is direction of c vector right in the same way tau is equal to r cross f this is the r suppose some particle is at this point n r is the position vector from this origin o right and you apply force at some angle theta at this point so this theta is the angle between r and f this is line of action of force and this one is position vector now you uh, direction is given by what tau equal to r cross f so this is a plane containing r and f right this one is the plane containing r and f yes x and y x plane and perpendicular to this plane is direction of torque it means along z axis it gives direction of torque it is perpendicular to the plane containing this r and f so its rule is given by it can also given by right hand thumb rule you curl your fingers of your right hand from r to in the direction of force f then the direction in which the thumb points give direction of torque at that point so direction of torque is given by right hand thumb rule according to this rule curl your fingers in the direction of r to f then the direction in which the thumb points give direction of torque at that point in this also if it is anti-clockwise direction rotation is anti-clockwise in that case you take tau as positive right and if it rotation is clockwise r to f is clockwise it means downward direction and tau you take negative so you can take uh, torque as positive when it is in anti-clockwise direction from r to f and it will take an as negative if it is in clockwise direction from r to f in this way you find the direction of torque right this torque is minimum when theta equal to zero theta zero means what sin theta is zero and sin theta means tau zero and if it is maximum at theta equal to 90 degree sin 90 is one so if you apply force at this point now it has two component right one is along r and another one is perpendicular to r this one is f cos theta along component and this perpendicular component is f sin theta this f cos component is called radial component because it is along radius vector and it is this component is along radius vector it means no turning effect is there it produce this f cos theta component produce no turning effect and this f sin theta is perpendicular to r so it means maximum turning effect is produced so f sin theta this one is called angular component of force and this component is responsible for producing turning effect right so you can write this as r cross f means tau equal to r f sin theta f sin of theta component is responsible for producing torque this component is called angular component and this f cos theta is called radial component with the help of this radial component there is no turning effect only this radial component is responsible for turning effect that's why its formula is tau equal to r f sin theta or r cross f so hope it's clear to our of how you find a direction of torque what is its formula when it is maximum when it is minimum that, that's why now the handle of the door is always at maximum distance from the fixed point it is always at the free end so that this distance r is maximum and maximum turning effect is there and you can easily open or close a door and also to produce maximum turning effect you apply a force 
perpendicular to this position vector right now so that maximum turning effect is there you can easily open or close the door if you apply force along this position vector then no turning effect is there so the best example for this torque is door you can easily describe this torque understand this torque with the help of that example right one more thing what is the formula for torque r cross f rf so its si unit is what its si unit becomes si unit of newton force is newton and this distance is meter and also its dimensional formula what is dimensional formula dimensional formula for force is what m l t yes t minus 2 and distance is what l so dimensional formula becomes m l square t minus 2 this is dimensional formula for torque and this one is si unit of torque newton meter so hope you understood all these things right please take a screenshot of this one then we move to the next topic that is angular momentum now next topic is angular momentum what is angular momentum it is rotational analogy of linear momentum you know in linear motion linear momentum is what amount of translatory motion possessed by a body in the same way in rotational motion the amount of turning motion possessed by a body is measured by a quantity that is called angular momentum in rotational motion uh, angular momentum is used to measure amount of turning motion possessed by a body it is moment of linear momentum like torque is what torque is moment of force na in the same way angular momentum is moment of linear momentum of a particle about a point right like torque is what force into perpendicular distance from the axis of rotation to the point at which force is applied in the same way angular momentum is represented by capital l it is equal to angular momentum into its perpendicular distance from the axis of rotation right suppose this is the point at which linear momentum is p and this one is the axis of rotation about the body rotates and this r is perpendicular distance from this axis of rotation to the point at which body possesses linear momentum p so this l equal to r into p but this formula is not always true it is only it is maximum angular momentum for 90 degree angle it means angle auto matters what is the angle between r and p and since it is a vector quantity so it has some direction also so first you write in vector form it can be written as l equal to r cross p r is the perpendicular distance from the axis of rotation to the point at which body possesses linear momentum p and p is linear momentum so you can write this as r p sin theta theta is angle between <coughs> r and p and it is a vector quantity from here it is clear that what is direction of angular momentum you know again a cross b equal to c cross point of two vector is a vector and its direction of c is what perpendicular to the plane containing a and b right in the same way direction of this angular momentum is perpendicular to the plane containing r and p the direction of angular momentum is perpendicular to the plane containing r and p and it is given by again right hand rule you curl your fingers from r to p then the direction in which the thumb points gives direction of angular momentum right when this angle theta is 90 degree angular momentum is maximum because sin 90 is 1 and when this theta is 0 degree angular momentum is 0 0 degree means what r and p both are in the same direction suppose this is direction of r position vector from this to the point at which body possesses linear momentum and if p is along this r then no rotational motion is there right so if theta is 0 it means r and p are in the same direction no rotational motion if theta is 90 degree it means if r and p are perpendicular to each other then it has maximum angular momentum suppose this particle p has linear momentum p at some angle theta with this r this is r and it makes some angle theta so this p has two components one is along r that is horizontal component p cos theta and another one is p sin theta which component produces which component measures turning motion p cos theta or p sin theta 
Yes, P cos theta is along R. P cos theta is radial component along the position vector. Radial component of linear momentum. Right? Linear momentum. And this is along R. It means angle between R and P cos theta is 0. So, it does not contribute any rotational or turning motion. Right? Now, this P sin theta is 90 degree to R and this P sin theta is angular component or you can say tangential component, angular, angular component and this angular component of linear momentum is perpendicular to this R. It means it poses, it measures maximum turning motion in a body, right? So, this P sin theta is responsible for rotational motion like F sin theta. F sin theta is responsible for turning effect in the same way P sin theta is responsible it measures maximum turning motion produced in a body. So hope it's clear to all of you what is torque what is angular momentum in rotational motion right please take a screenshot of this one then we'll discuss relation between these torque and angular momentum. Now relation between torque and angular momentum what is relation between this torque and angular momentum both are physical terms. Now, relation between torque and angular momentum, both these terms comes under rotational motion. You know what is angular momentum, what is torque. So, the relation between these two can be derived in this way. You know, angular momentum is what? L equal to R cross P. P is linear momentum. Differentiating both sides, then dl by dt is equal to d by dt R cross P. Now, here applying this product rule, dr by dt cross P plus now, R cross dp by dt, you just apply here product, product rule, right? Now, this dr by dt is what? Velocity v. This dr by dt is velocity of the body v cross p plus R cross dp by dt. And what is this p? p here is linear momentum mv. You can write in place of p, you can write mv. So, v cross mv plus r dp by dt. This m is constant. You take m outside. Then this v cross v. Both are in the same direction and cross product applying cross product rule. i cross i is what? 0. In the same way v cross v equal to 0. So, this first term becomes 0. Only left is second term r cross dp by dt. And you know r cross. This dp by dt is what? Change in linear rate of change of linear momentum. According to Newton's second law, what? Force applied on any object is directly proportional to rate of change of linear momentum. So, this according to Newton's second law, dp by dt is what? Force. So, you can write dl by dt equal to r cross f and you know r cross f is what? This is torque tau. So, in this way, dl by dt equal to tau. You get this relation dl by dt equal to tau. This L is angular momentum and this tau is tau. This is relation between this torque and angular momentum, right? Remember this formula dl by dt equal to tau. Now, conservation of angular momentum. You know conservation of linear momentum. If no external force acts on any body, then linear momentum is always conserved. Total initial linear momentum is equal to total final linear momentum. In the same way, you know dl by dt is what? Tau. If tau is 0, tau net is 0 or no external torque acting on any body, then dl by dt is also 0. From this equation, it means L is what? Constant. So, here you can write, if no external torque acts on the body, then total angular momentum remains constant. This is conservation of angular momentum. You can write formula for torque and angular momentum for a system of particles. For a system of particles, suppose n number of particles are there, then you can write L equal to summation Ri cross Pi I equal to 1 to n. L is what? R cross P for one particle. For a system of particles and number of particles, you can write L equal to you can write in this way, L is suppose first particle has angular momentum L1, second has L2, third has L3. In this way, you can write and L is what? R1 cross P1 plus L2 is what? R2 cross P2 plus L3. That's in this way, you can write 
for a system of particles l equal to summation i equal to 1 to n r i cross p i in the same way torque torque is what r cross f for a number of particles i equal to 1 to n tau equal to summation r i cross f i this is torque for a system of particles in this way you find relation between torque and angular momentum for a system of particles you can write in this way and conservation of angular momentum so in rotational motion these two terms are very important angular momentum and torque what is torque what is angular momentum you know in linear motion linear momentum and force is responsible right but in rotational motion these two terms angular momentum and torque is very important so please take a screenshot of this one then we will move to the next topic that is equilibrium of a rigid body next equilibrium of a rigid body when you say that a rigid body is in equilibrium a body is said to be in equilibrium if it is in translational equilibrium translational means there is no linear motion it means net force acting on the body is zero so force is zero means acceleration of the center of mass is zero and if acceleration is zero it means velocity is constant velocity constant means linear momentum is constant and also if a system is in rotational equilibrium rotational means there is no net torque acting on the body net torque is zero and torque zero means angular acceleration is zero it means angular velocity is zero and if angular velocity is zero it means angular momentum is zero so you can say that a body is said to be in equilibrium if it is in translational as well as rotational equilibrium it means net force and net torque acting on the body is zero there is no linear motion there is no rotational motion and both is zero it means linear momentum and angular momentum both are conserved then you can say that that body is in equilibrium right angular momentum and linear momentum both is constant right now next is partial equilibrium of a rigid body what is partial this one is equilibrium of a rigid body totally when you say that the body is equilibrium when body is both in translational as well as rotational equilibrium but what is this partial equilibrium of rigid body a body is said to be in partial equilibrium if it is in translational equilibrium and not in rotational either there is only one equilibrium either if it is in translational translational equilibrium means net force zero there is no linear momentum but not in rotational it means net torque is not equal to zero for example this one suppose at this point force is acting in upward direction and at this point force is acting in downward direction so these two forces are equal opposite so net force is what net force is zero but you know this side force is acting upward direction and this is the fixed point so r cross f torque is in this direction here r cross f so torque is in anti clockwise direction both torque acting in the same direction it means there is some net torque right and this system forms a couple only this one is called couple i will discuss after this one couple a system of two equal opposite forces separated by some distance right second is partial equilibrium of rigid body means you can say also if a body is in rotational equilibrium but not in translational rotational means net torque acting on the body is zero there is no rotational motion but net force is not zero for example this one right at this point force is acting in downward direction at this point force is acting in again downward direction so both forces are acting in the same direction it means there is some net force net force is not zero it means the body is not in translational equilibrium but here torque is acting in clockwise direction this one is r and r cross f is clockwise here this one is r so that r cross f is anti clockwise this side torque is acting in anti clockwise so both these torques act in opposite direction it means net torque is zero this one is example of lever best example for this one is lever where body is in rotational equilibrium but not in translational equilibrium and the best example for this is when you open the cap of water bottle you apply equal opposite force right now one force this side and the force downward both forces are equal opposite so net force is zero but the cap rotates it means there is a rotational equilibrium uh, sorry not in rotational equilibrium some torque is there turning effect is there so these are about equilibrium 
body is said to be in fully equilibrium if both body is in translational as well as rotational equilibrium it means both linear and angular momentum is conserved partial equilibrium is if a body is in translational equilibrium but not in rotational or either rotational equilibrium but not in translational figures are given here one more thing from here next topic you can see it couple what do you mean by this couple from this one a system of two equal opposite forces these two forces are equal but opposite direction separated by some distance system of two equal and opposite forces separated by some by some distance it forms a couple and what is this formula formula for this couple is one torque is in this direction anti clockwise this is both torque added and net formula becomes r cross f then this is rf so formula for a couple becomes force into perpendicular distance between these two forces right force into perpendicular distance between these two forces i mean f into 2r this is about couple so hope it's clear to all of you please take a screenshot of this one after that we will discuss about principle of moment right now principle of moment for a lever what is lever the best example for lever is seesaw you know seesaw right so one side there is some load and on the side there is some effort is required right now this lever is in mechanical equilibrium when a rigid body is said to be in mechanical equilibrium if both it is in translational as well as rotational equilibrium so this lever is in mechanical equilibrium if it is in translational equilibrium translational means net force you can write f net equal to 0 and f net equal to 0 this upward force reaction force is equal to total downward force it means r equal to f1 plus f2 it means r minus f1 plus f2 equal to 0 this is first condition and also rotational equilibrium rotational equilibrium is net torque acting on the body is zero net torque acting on the zero means clockwise torque equal to anti clockwise torque so this side uh, this is the fixed point this fixed point about which the end free ends rotates that is called fulcrum this one is fixed point so distance from this fulcrum to this end is d1 and at this end d2 from this fulcrum right now what is torque acting at this point load torque you know r cross f so this is r cross f it means clockwise rotate anti clockwise rotation and this size torque is this one is r cross f it means anti clockwise rotation so this side torque is acting in clockwise and this side torque is acting in anti clockwise so both torque acts in opposite direction it means net torque is zero so this side torque is f1 into d1 this side is f2 into d2 both are equal it means f1 d1 minus f2 d2 equal to zero. this is equation number 2 so this lever is in equilibrium if both these conditions satisfy it is in translational equilibrium as well as rotational equilibrium now what is the main principle it comes from this equation number 2 suppose this f1 is load and this f2 is effort where you are applying some force then this load lifts up or down right so and this distance to this load from the fulcrum is d1 this one is called load arm this d1 is called load arm and distance of this fulcrum fixed point to the effort is called effort arm this d2 is called effort arm so here it is in rotational equilibrium it means f1 d1 equal to f2 d2 f1 means load and d1 means load arm so load into load arm equal to effort into effort arm this is the thing but principle of moment for a lever right what is the principle of moment for lever load into load arm equal to effort into effort arm now there is a mechanical advantage of this machine lever mechanical advantage is f1 by 
F2. How much effort you are applying and how much load it's lift, right? So this is F1 by F2. And from this equation, F1 by F2 is equal to what? D2 by D1. Na? F1 D1 equal to F2 D2. So from here, right? From here, F1 by F2 equal to D2 by D1. This is the formula for mechanical advantage. If this mechanical advantage is greater than 1, it means this lever or machine is good or bad. If mechanical advantage is greater than 1, it means F1 by F2 greater than 1, it means F1 greater than F2. And if F1 is greater than F2, F2 is very small, it means small effort is required to lift large load, right? This mechanical advantage greater than 1 means small effort lift large load. So this one is good or bad? It's good, no? its efficiency is high. If mechanical advantage is less than 1, it means F1 by F2 less than 1. It means F1 less than F2. F1 is less than F2. It means large effort lift only small load. So its efficiency is low. It's not so good. So this type of machine we require where it lifts large load with the help of only small effort. This is principle of movements for a lever. Please remember this one. Load into load arm equal to effort into effort now. This one is important. Also mechanical advantage. What is mechanical advantage? Formula. When it is good, when it is greater than 1, what happens? When it is less than 1, what happens? After this, there is one small definition that is center of gravity. What is this center of gravity? It is that point where whole gravitational torque about that point is zero. Suppose there is one point in between this body, right? Suppose this one is one point. So at this point, whole gravitational torque acting on that body is zero. Gravitational torque, torque zero means there is no rotational motion. Net torque is zero. And what is the formula for torque? Torque is R cross F, right? So F is gravitational force is what? M into G. There are different masses are there, M1, M2, M2, but G is uniform. So you can write F as Mi into G, I equal to 1 to N. G is constant, Mi R I equal to 0. It means Mi R I equal to 0. If this condition satisfy, then that point inside the body is called center of gravity. So this is the case when we find that net torque acting at that point is zero. So we find this condition. Suppose if net torque acts on the body, it means is, net is not equal to zero. It means body starts rotating and it falls. What does it mean? If net torque acting on a body at that point is not equal to zero, it means that body starts rotating and falls. So when main conclusion is that if G is uniform inside the gravity, it means acceleration due to gravity is uniform, then center of gravity and center of mass coincide, right? Center of gravity coincide with center of mass if G is uniform throughout the body. It means at center of gravity, whole weight of the body is supposed to be concentrated. So this is about center of gravity. Hope it's clear to all of you. Please take a screenshot of this one. Then we will move to the next topic that is comparison between linear and rotational motion. Now next, actually there is only one topic left that is moment of inertia. But before that one, you must know about analogy between translational and rotational motion. What is the analogy between or comparison between you can say rotational and translational motion. So here left side of the linear motion or translational motion and this side rotational motion, right? Now you know in linear motion, displacement is represented by S. So in the same way, in rotational motion, there is some angular displacement represented by theta. Suppose body is at point this one and body rotates about some axis with some angular velocity and it moves with some angular displacement theta. So this arc is linear displacement S and this one is radius. So this S is linear displacement. This theta is angular displacement which is given by theta equal to S by R. Second one, velocity. In linear motion, velocity, you can say linear velocity represented by V and it is equal to rate of change of displacement ds by dt. In the same way, in rotational motion, there is angular velocity represented by omega. 
and this is equal to like this one v equal to ds by dt so in place of s you write omega equal to d theta by dt here angular displacement is there third one acceleration it is represented by a and this a equal to dv by dt in the same way in rotational motion it is angular acceleration alpha and it is equal to d omega by dt rate of change of angular velocity next force you know to move any body to produce linear motion in any body what is required yes force is required in the same way to produce rotational motion what is required torque is required is represented by tau now what is the expression for force you know if i want to move this body i have to apply some force but this body is unable to move due to some inertia it body has some inertia and you know mass is a measure of inertia in linear motion so this body has some inertia due to which it does not move itself we have to apply some force to move this body from one place to another place in the same way to produce rotational motion uh, we have to apply some torque because that body also has some what in rotational motion moment of inertia in linear motion body has some inertia in rotational motion the body has some moment of inertia due to which it enables to rotate itself so what is moment of inertia this is a new term in rotational motion right in place of mass in linear motion mass is replaced by moment of inertia and that is represented by i now what is this moment of inertia what is the expression for this one i will discuss after this topic right analogy between translation and rotational motion you just understood that understood that uh, moment of inertia is inability of the body to rotate itself unless and until some torque is applied right it is represented by i now you know force is ma in the same way in rotational motion mass is replaced by moment of inertia mass is a measure of inertia in rotational motion it is uh, replaced by moment of inertia i so f equal to ma here m in place of m you write i in place of angle, uh, uh, linear acceleration you have to write angular acceleration alpha so tau equal to i alpha also according to newton newton's first law you can write f equal to dp by dt this p is linear momentum and this angular momentum is what it is represented by l so you can write in place of this f equal to dp by dt in rotational motion tau equal to dl by dt we already derived this expression right now next now there is one new term this moment of inertia inertia i will discuss this one in detail after this in linear motion work work is what f into s so in rotational motion work done is what f is replaced by torque and linear displacement is replaced by angular displacement w equal to tau theta in linear motion kinetic energy is what half mv square in rotational motion kinetic energy rotational kinetic energy m is replaced by moment of inertia i and v linear velocity is replaced by angular velocity so half i omega square linear momentum is p equal to mv you know angular momentum is represented by capital n in place of m you just replace i v replace omega so l equal to i omega so if you know the re, all the relations in case of linear motion you can easily write all the equations in rotational motion just uh, what is linear displacement what is angular displacement what is linear velocity what is angular velocity what is linear acceleration what is angular acceleration in linear motion force in rotational motion torque in linear motion mass this one is important in rotational motion moment of inertia if you know all these first five terms now you can write any equations in case of rotational motion like power is what power is f into v so in rotational motion power is what f is replaced by tau and linear velocity is replaced by uh, replaced by angular velocity so power equal to tau omega so these are some analogy between translational and rotational motion you can also write equations of motion in case of linear motion if a body moves with uniform acceleration then there are three equations of motion v equal to u plus at s equal to u plus uh, s equal to ut plus half at square v square minus u square equal to 2s this is in case of linear motion right now 
in the same way you can write in rotational motion also equations of motion how you write this linear velocity is replaced by angular velocity acceleration is replaced by angular acceleration so v is final velocity u is initial velocity so you can write here final velocity omega initial velocity represented by omega not so omega equal to omega plus alpha t this is first root equation of motion in rotation second s equal to ut plus half at square so this linear displacement replaced by angular displacement theta ut u is initial velocity here omega not t plus half at square in place of a right angular acceleration alpha t square so theta equal to omega not t plus half alpha t square third equation of motion v square minus u square equal to two ways here you can write omega square minus omega not square this one is final velocity this one is initial velocity equal to two in place of a you can write alpha and s theta so these are three equations of rotational motion if a body moves with uniform angular acceleration alpha so hope it's clear to all of you right analogy between translation and rotational motion please take a screenshot of this one then we'll move to the most important and last topic that is moment of inertia now last and most important topic of this chapter is moment of inertia i already told you that what is moment of inertia it is inability of a body to rotate itself until unless you have to apply some torque right why due to because it body has some moment of inertia it is represented by capital i so it is rotational analogy of mass it is rotational analogy of mass in case of linear motion mass is a measure of inertia due to inertia body not able to move from one place to another place in the same way in rotational motion due to moment of inertia body does not rotate itself what is the expression for this one okay you know f equal to ma you multiply it r with both sides then rf equal to rma this rf is what this is torque tau equal to mr this one is linear acceleration what is relation between linear acceleration and angular acceleration a equal to alpha r so you can write in place of a alpha r here this becomes tau equal to mr square alpha so you know f equal to ma so this f is replaced by tau a is replaced by alpha so this mass in case of rotational motion replaced by mr square and this mr square is nothing but it is called moment of inertia i so this i equal to mr square is called moment of inertia its expression is given by i equal to mr square on which factor this moment of inertia depends a body rotates about say some axis of rotation so it only depends on axis of rotation it does not depend on angular velocity whatever it is suppose this body is rotating about this axis of rotation so only this moment of inertia depends on axis of rotation about which the body rotates its si unit is what mass kg and r meter square kg meter square so you can define moment of inertia inertia in this way it is equal to product of mass of the body and square of distance from the axis of rotation this is moment of inertia right for a system of particles suppose there are large number of particles in a system m1 m2 m3 kept at a distance r1 r2 r3 from the axis of rotation so you can write moment of inertia of all these particles m1 r1 square plus m2 r2 square plus dash 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 so you can write i equal to summation m i r i square i equal to 1 to n for a n number of particles so this is moment of inertia for a system of particles for continuous body you are not able to differentiate mass m1 from m2 so you just replace this m by small mass dm and in summation is replaced by integration so for continuous body moment of inertia is given by i equal to r square dm so hope it's clear to all of you now uh, you have to remember some points what is the moment of inertia of a ring about the axis about perpendicular to the axis moment of inertia of a solid sphere hollow sphere hollow sphere everything so you just remember that chart right and uh, no need to derive that moment of inertia of all the bodies so please take a screenshot of this one then will, i will write that moment of inertia of different bodies a uh, calculation of moment of inertia of some body first one is moment of inertia of a thin circular ring there are two cases about an axis through its center and perpendicular to its plane about this 
एक्सिस इज पासिंग थ्रू इट्स सेंटर परपेटिकुलर टू इट्स प्लेट्स इस मोमेंट ऑफ इनर्शिया इज गिवन बाय आई इक्वल टू एम आर स्क्वायर जस्ट रिमेंबर दिस वन अबाउट एनी डायमीटर दिस दिस डायमीटर और दिस डायमीटर मोमेंट ऑफ इनर्शिया ऑफ अ थिन सर्कुलरिंग अबाउट एनी डायमीटर इज गिवन बाय हाफ एम आर स्क्वायर राइट सेकेंड वन मोमेंट ऑफ इनर्शिया ऑफ ए यूनिफॉर्म सर्कुलर डिस्क इन दिस ऑल्सो दे आर टू केसेस अबाउट एन एक्सिस थ्रू इट्स सेंटर एंड परपेंडिकुलर टू इट्स प्लेन इन दिस वन मोमेंट ऑफ इनर्शिया इज गिवेन बाई आई इक्वल टू हाफ एम आर स्क्वायर इन दिस थिन सर्कुलर रिंग मोमेंट ऑफ इनर्शिया अबाउट इट्स सेंटर परपेंडिकुलर टू इट्स प्लेन इज गिवेन बाई आई इक्वल टू एम आर स्क्वायर हियर हाफ एम आर एम आर स्क्वायर हियर अबाउट एनी टाइम इट हाफ एम आर स्क्वायर इन दैट वन हाफ ऑफ दैट वन it means 1 by 4 mr square so this is moment of inertia of a thin uniform circular disc right third one is moment of inertia of a thin uniform rod suppose this is a uniform rod of length l then about moment of inertia about perpendicular bisector about this one perpendicular bisector at center passing through the center of this rod is given by half sorry ml square by 12 this is moment of inertia of a thin uniform rod about perpendicular bisector about one end of the rod it is given by i equal to m l square by 3 right fourth one moment of inertia of a hollow cylinder about its own axis this is hollow cylinder about its own axis is i equal to mr square now moment of inertia this one is hollow cylinder now in solid cylinder about its own axis is given by just half of that one i equal to half mr square and last moment of inertia of a solid sphere solid sphere about its axis about any diameter it is given by i equal to 2 by 5 mr square so you have to remember all these points moment of inertia of different bodies right no need to derive these expressions please take a screenshot of this one then move to the one last topic that is not in your syllabus but still you know about that one that is theorem of perpendicular parallel axis now last topic of this chapter is what is radius of gyration theorem parallel perpendicular axis first is what is radius of gyration suppose this is a point c where whole mass of the body is concentrated that is m m be the whole mass of the body and this one is axis of rotation about which the body rotates so this radius of gyration distance from the axis of rotation at the point where whole mass of the body is concentrated it is represented by k it is distance from axis of rotation at which whole mass of the body is assumed to be concentrated so you can easily write you know what is moment of inertia of the whole body i equal to m if distances are m r square so here distance from the axis of rotation is what k so m k square so in, you can also write its moment of inertia would be same at which the actual distribution of mass it is noted by k and i you know at this point moment of inertia is what i equal to mk square and k equal to root over m by i this is the expression for radius of gyration it's a sin it is meter and it is a scalar quantity so nothing more about this one this definition is there radius of gyration at uh, it is the point where whole mass of the body is concentrated and it is distance from the axis of rotation to that point right now there are two theorem just you know what is this it's not in your syllabus theorem of perpendicular axis and theorem of parallel axis suppose there are two axes one is this x axis this one is y axis and third one which is perpendicular to this plane it means x and y axis z axis so moment of inertia about this z axis is equal to sum of moment of inertia about these two parallel axis which are perpendicular parallel to this plane and perpendicular to this third axis this one is x axis this one is y axis and moment of inertia about z is e equal to sum of moment of inertia about x and y axis this is theorem of perpendicular axis it states that moment of inertia of a planar body about an axis perpendicular to these two planes is equal to sum of its moment of inertia about two perpendicular axis concurrent with the perpendicular axis lying in the plane of this body so this is theorem of perpendicular axis ij equal to ix plus y iy and this theorem is used when you uh, uh, when you have to calculate moment of inertia about any planar body any regular shape body right now and another one is theorem of parallel axis these two theorems are used to calculate moment of inertia in that case it's very helpful what is this theorem of parallel axis suppose there is any planar body and suppose this one 
is axis passing through center of mass and you want to calculate moment of inertia about this axis which is parallel to the axis passing through center of mass and distance between these two is r so about uh, according to this theorem it states that moment of inertia of a body about any axis about this y suppose this one is y and this one is y dash about any axis means y dash is equal to sum of moment of inertia about a parallel axis which is passing through center of mass it means i y dash equal to i cm plus product of its mass and radius square of distance between two parallel axis right so this is theorem of parallel axis if you want to calculate moment of inertia about this y dash axis and this y axis is passing through center of mass so moment of inertia about this y dash axis is equal to sum of moment of inertia about an axis passing through center of mass it means this one plus product of mass of this body is m and distance between these two parallel axis are so m r square this is theorem of parallel axis you just remember these two theorem these are not in the syllabus so it's not so important so these are all about system of particles and rotational motion please take a screenshot of this one so with this i am going to end my class hope my this little effort helps to understand this chapter very well if you want other one shot revision of other chapters also please write in the comment box up to then students keep revising and stay tuned with this channel thank you